So the, um, what I'm going to, um, to tell you in this presentation that uh, with these new big machines, as well as with new facilities, experimental facilities, the new era coming for the science discovery. And it turned out that I want to demonstrate that, that access to these machines, to these powerful machines, is critical. So I'm going to show you several examples where our simulations that should drive the, the experiment, uh, direct experiments to observe what we predict. So this is an important thing. So we do know uh, how to apply these machines very effectively. But the most important, um, uh, the most, imp I, I don't know, okay. The most important thing is to have very accurate uh, interatomic potentials, because I'm going to talk about molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics, the heart of molecular dynamics is uh, the interatomic potentials. Uh, interatomic potential, interatomic potential that you use to simulate atoms. If your simulations are not accurate, and I'm particularly interested in carbon, it's critical to have quantum accuracy. So if you don't do simulations at level of G of T, you get wrong results. So this is the mo most important message. And the major breakthrough was done very recently by, by Aidan Thompson and uh, his, uh, his team by developing uh, SNAP, very accurate interatomic potential, machine learning interatomic potential. But what also very important that this implementation was done on GPU machines. So there was a dedicated team of people who worked on making sure that this is the best performing intratomic potential at the market right now. So uh, before I will go into the science part, uh, I'd like to acknowledge contributions of different people because sometimes, you know, if, if I will be running out of time, uh, I must keep this important part. But, um, uh, so this work done by um, my group and uh, some postdocs, all of them already graduated, so, but uh, the work done when they were graduate students, Kian Guen Kong, Ashley Williams, Jonathan Willman. Uh, we had an important collaborator, Anatoly Belanoshka, who advised, advised us on uh, quantum molecular dynamics, large-scale quantum molecular dynamics simulations that we use for training SNAP. Uh, important critical contribution from SNAP architects, uh, Aidan Thompson and Mitch Wood. So actually, this uh, major project started so that I met, uh, I not met, I, I know Aidan for many years, but, but we had a conversation during conference four years ago, at shock conference. And then we came to conclusion that SNAP is where to go. So I sent students to train, to train uh, so Aidan and Mitch trained them uh, to use this new technology very, powerful, very, very important technology. And uh, also important contribution from these uh, LAMPS uh, SNAP Crocus developers. And I'm going to briefly mention about this Gordon Bell simulation that we've done with SNAP. Uh, Stan Moore, uh, Rahul, Gawiatri, Evan Weinberg. So these people will be at the uh, Hackathon later at this workshop, uh, at this series of the workshops. Uh, also, experiments, so this is something that we actually lead these experiments. So IMPI on several experimental projects, so we pushed experimental people, persuaded them. They, don't, they didn't believe in our simulations for the first time, and then we persuaded them it's worth investing time, money, and effort to do this big simulation, uh, big, big experiments to confirm our simulations. So John Eggert, Marius Muller, Terry Kapari, Sebastian Hamel, Andy Kruger, Ray Smith. Uh, another important uh, co experimental collaborator, Sally Tracy. Uh, people from Sandia, Patricia Karica, Tom Au. Computer time, very important. So we are the major users of these um, big facilities uh, through Insight and ALCC programs, Summit. So on Monday, we start running on Frontier. So we had a... Uh, webinar yesterday uh, explaining how to, how to start this, but uh, on April 3rd, Frontier will be available for early users. <coughs> we are very excited about this opportunity. And uh, experimental campaigns, 
that um, provide the experimental time through uh, special uh, grant applications through Discovery Science Program at uh, Livermore, uh, Lesinet US run by the uh, um, Fusion Energy Sciences Office of DOE, and Z Fundamental Science for a Program at Sandia, and of course the funding. Okay, so this is outline of my talk. So I'll briefly go through the outstanding some problems why we need longer time and length scales in MD simulations. Briefly go through the machine learning interactive potentials and uh, their performance snap. I'm talking about the specifically snap, snap performance at, uh, uh, at uh, leadership class HPC systems. And this is the science part of my talk. So I will concentrate on the solving important science problem in extreme uh, material science, uh, explaining metastability of diamond and the pathway to synthesize elusive high pressure post diamond BC phase. And um, this is something that Aiden already previewed on Monday during his talk about these uh, big shock simulations of diamond. And if time permits, I just mentioned how we push this new um, breakthrough. So you know, everyone knows that on December the 5th, there was the um, uh, experiment was performed on December the 5th, but a week later there was a big announcement of the ach achievement of the fusion for the first time, so nucle uh, nuclear fusion, uh, ignition uh, at uh, National Ignition Facility. But the major motivation, I'm going to talk about carbon. Carbon is very important material for planetary science. There is some um, indication that diamond is present in interiors of Uranus, Neptune, and also carbon rich planets. Important science question, what kind of phases of carbon are inside of these planets that experience very high pressures and high temperatures? Um, I mentioned about this major breakthrough, historic experiment. So this, I think that is a major science discovery 21st century. At this moment, maybe something else will come up later. We don't know. Uh, but um, diamond is used as the fuel capsule that is uh, irradiated, very powerful, 192 laser beams. Uh, laser ablation creates uh, rocket size, uh, rocket type effect that uh, uh, initiate shock waves, and shock waves compress the fuel, uh, deuterium, uh, tritium uh, fuel that inside of this capsule. By the way, this capsule is minuscule, one millimeter. And the fuel tube is uh, 40 micron. Fuel tube to put the uh, deuterium tritium inside. Could you imagine how technology advanced, so we can do these things on a very, 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 very tiny scale. Um, but important problem with the shock compression of diamond, and this, this was the, uh, the key to achieve this ignition, to understand what happens when you compress diamond. The reason why? Because uh, these um, uh, different inhomogeneities upon the compression defects create uh, an interface between diamond and uh, a uh, few, they create hydrodynamic instabilities that kill your ignition. So it was very important to understand how to shock diamond in such a way that it doesn't create. So actually you have to melt, melt diamond completely to have the homogeneous state during the first st stage of compression. And then, uh, so you have to go in the melt line, uh, in, the, in, in the liquid region of the carbon phase diagram to avoid this. And of course, it has a detrimental effect. So that's why it took so long to achieve this ignition because you create a lot of uh, entropic effects. So it's called this uh, adiabat. Adiabat was very high because you have, to, you have to go to 12 megabars, very high pressure. And it creates, it hits the, uh, the deuterium treating fuel substantially. That's why uh, it took so long. So the question is, can we lower this? Can we use other materials? Then can allow us to substantially increase the yield because this is what is needed for the, uh, for the uh, fusion energy plant. So this is what we want. So explaining you the problem with the uh, extreme metastability of diamond, 
So diamond phase diagram is well known, uh, sorry, phase diagram of carbon, well known. So diamonds up to one terapascal, uh, then BC8 from one terapascal to three terapascal, simple cubic and simple hexagonal. So very simple phase diagram was predicted by DFT calculations in the 80s and 90s, but enormous efforts we were taking to observe this BC8 phase and all the experiments failed, except of one indirect indication by Sandy experiment at the machine, but no diffraction was made. So this is, uh, this is actually a nature publication that, that reported that you can press diamond to uh, 20 megabars to TPA, and you see only diamond. So this, this, uh, this is a diffraction pattern during this compression. So there is no indication that, that BC8 is formed. So the question is why? Because you are substantially in the very, very thermonically st stable area of BC8 and you don't see it. So why? This is what we want to answer with our simulations. So I mentioned that we are interested in the shock compression. Shock compression is ideal for molecular dynamic simulations. The reason why? Because time and length scales match experimental time and length scales, almost close to what we can achieve with MD simulations. We are talking about the micrometer length scales and nanosecond time scales. So sometimes um, we, we can do micrometer, but we can do fraction of and a second, the reason why, because diamond is pretty strong, you run shockwave that propagates with huge velocity, 20 kilometers per second or 20 nanometers per picosecond. So the length, you know, these microns divide length by uh, velocity, you get fraction of nanoseconds of the propagation time. This is what we can do with MD. Uh, so the, uh, our goal is to provide atomic scale insight at experimental time less scales. Critical component, as I said, quantum micro description of the interferometric directions. GPU enabled machines, because this is the major platform right now. Okay? So if we cannot run these simulations of GPU platforms, we cannot do uh, exciting science. And also, the access to these platforms is important. So I'll probably skip this, but in MD simulations, we, uh, we calculate the forces on each atom and uh, advance the trajectories uh, by doing this numerical integration of uh, Newton equation. The critical component is the potential energy surface, more secure DFT, but you cannot do, uh, you can do only hundreds of atoms, as was discussed. Some people push into 100,000 atoms, but uh, you cannot do uh, 100,000 time steps with fraction of femtosecond time, st time step uh, with, the, with MD. So we do need uh, to have very accurate description previous intraterm potentials, the empirical Reber type of potentials, they failed uh, because they were trained on the new equilibrium conditions. If you try to push them into the compression or uh, expansion will fail, so all these Reba, A Reba, Reacts of F, LC Bop, and so on and so forth, they are too far from DFT. So I'm showing the example of the uh, graphene, which is a very simple system to look at. So as I said, the major breakthrough is the uh, appearance, advent of the machine learning potentials. So all the potentials, fingerprints of very complex atomic environment, each atom is fingerprinted, not just one, but several, actually many of the descriptors that describe all the possible at atomic environments of each atom, at, uh, each atom I. So once you have the descriptors, you construct the potential energy uh, as a function of this code, uh, as a function of these descriptors, and then you train on uh, DFT calculations. So SNAP, uh, developed by Aiden and Mitch, at Sandia, so these are the major publications. So potential energy is written as the linear and uh, quadratic um, functions of the descriptors. So you have the um, vector beta for the uh, linear part and matrix alpha, and you have a lot of coefficients you have to train. So uh, this is the step, these are the steps of the SNAP development database, 
machine training, machine learning training, and ex extensive validation. So this is something that Aiden showed, but I want to point out this range. 50 megabars and temperatures up to 20,000, okay? So this is our goal. We want to get as accurate as possible, as accurate as DFT, okay? And we did achieve it. Uh, so what, what is our database? So we have different structures. We have static structures, stable structures, these uh, diamond BCA, simple cubic, and so on and so forth. Metastable structures, some uh, structures that high in energy but uh, solid state structures uh, at different pressures and temp uh, different, different pressures. So at this at static data, um, we don't have temperature. But then we run. QMD large, QMD simulations, especially for liquids and two-phase solid liquid type of things. This size simulation turned out were critical to have in database structures that having up to 1,000 atoms. So this is very important to have the liquid structures in database to train intraton potentials. It's a key to achieve the accuracy. So this is our database complexity around 400,000 uh, equations that we want to solve with machine learning. Um, and uh, so this is how we do training. So uh, we, uh, we use FitSnap. We have objective function, but that includes all these uh, structures that we put in database. We, we, do, uh, um, uh, we solve for coefficients using FitSnap, but then there is the quarter that optimizes the weights of these uh, different groups of, of, the, uh, of the structures in the database, and then we do the validation. If validation is good, we have the production quality potential. It turned out we had to make several, several iterations, testing, running production simulations, finding problems, adding something to the database until we achieved the final uh, production quality uh, potential, and this is the demonstration of this quality. So the, uh, the, there are some um, uh, QMG, so we compare QMG with SNAP, what we compare uh, melt lines for diamond, BC, at simple cubic, uh, and also there is a uh, hydrostatic hugonet, so I'm going to talk about this hydrostatic hugonet, is a special equation of state when you constrain uh, the pressure, temperature, and uh, density using conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So this is especially important for the shock compression for, this sim for the experiments. And uh, so you see that for the, uh, for the phase diagram, axial integrating with DFT. So then we look more closely. We, we go into this triple point, important triple point between the uh, diamond BC8 and liquid. And we calculate, so in, in, all, in this point we have three phases. We calculate the radio distribution function DFT versus SNAP. You see that uh, the, uh, the differences are very minuscule. And then we go along the melt line, uh, diamonds and BC8, and look at the uh, um, uh, density difference between the solid phase and liquid phase. This is important to understand why this um, melt line has maximum, because at some point, According to Clapeyron and Clausius equation, liquid becomes denser than solid, and that's why you have the change in slope, so you have this maximum. And uh, this is what we see, so this, this is the change in uh, solid liquids, and you see that pretty good agreement with DFT. So there is, of course, the, uh, the change in slope because you switch from one curve to another. And this is 3% on average. Yes? So this is extremely high pressure. Like QMD, do you need to do something special, like consider all the four electrons? Or? Okay, so we did very thorough validation of QMD calculations. We spent a lot of time just looking at the pseudo-potentials, cutoff, k-points. Actually, we don't use k-points because we don't want k-points. We want gamma points in uh, QMD simulations. That's why we use big, big, big cell size, okay? So, so all, these, all these QMD simulations, 500 atoms, so it's a big, and we check. And by the way, we found one problem very recently uh, when we started comparing with the experiment that we can reproduce uh, some experimental data. We looked at DFT, DFT is fine. Then we found that um, DFT is not fine because 
uh, the size of the cell in one direction was less than 10 angstrom. So we have to increase, double the size of the, of the cell, run new QMD simulations, retrain SNAP, and then put it back. So it's important. It is important, really important. Okay, so then uh, another validation through the experiment. So this, this has so-called Hugonian to USUP. So as I said, we'd be solving for the conservation of mass, momentum, and energy. So we have this step type of thing. You run the wave that compresses material. So you have the finite state, initial state, and that constrained by this conservation of mass, energy, momentum. It gives you the velocity of, uh, of the wave versus the piston velocity, velocity of the material that you push with the piston. And you can clearly see that there is a very good agreement at high compressions. Um, both QMD and SNAP, but there is some problem with these. And this is related to the crystalline anisotropy. So in this case, you cannot describe the response of the material in hydrodynamic approximation when you apply pressure from all three directions this in the same way. Uh, and this is something that you don't need to require explicit shock simulations. That's why it's very important. So excellent green better than 3% uh, for, for the, for the um, equation of state and um, shock units. But now, I, I, I decided to put this slide because of the discussion we had yesterday in terms of the benchmarking things. So this is the how do other carbon machine learning potentials perform. I must warn that our potential was specifically, our potential was specifically trained for high pressure temperature conditions. So we wouldn't expect to have these potentials to be as good as SNAP because they were trained on the ambient condition data. Okay? So, but what is, what is important and confirms what, uh, what Aidan uh, was discussing yesterday about immortality, uh, atomic cluster expansion. So atomic cluster expansion hasn't been trained on the high pressure data, but you clearly see that, that it's in very good agreements with DFT as well as in SNAP, although it wasn't trained. So it means that it's really, really good descriptors to use for the, for the machine learning potentials. And also the performance, so uh, different, uh, different uh, sizes of the system. Uh, and um, so ACE also performs almost on par with, with, with SNAP. Other potentials, GAP, uh, NNP, so this is NNP, so it's an NNP by uh, Sebastian Hammer, uh, Hammer and others, very recent, also doing a good job, but extremely slow. We couldn't put the performance into this because you cannot do big simulations. You can do you know, a thousand items, that's it. So, uh, so I'll briefly go through the implementation. So this is something that is efficiently implement implemented and uh, we, our team got together, Aiden, Meech, and uh, Stan Moore, and um, Evan uh, Weinberg, and uh, Rahul. Uh, uh, we got together and we decided that let's try Gordon Bell simulation, run Gordon Bell simulation with SNAP. We know that we are going to fail because the previous Gordon Bell prize was given to DeepMD. So there was no chance for us to get, <laughs> to get this <laughs> second time for machine learning simulations. But we did all our best. Uh, so our test system is the one billion atom amorphous sample. And so um, I might have some time to explain, um, explain uh, why amorphous carbon is important. Uh, so we, we did the um, um, NVT MD simulations 12 megabars, 5,000 Kelvin, 100 MG steps. This is for scanning tests, just simply for scanning tests. Uh, this is step size, uh, samples of different dimensions. So we went up to 20 billion atoms. And, um, and then once we did the scaling, we determined what, it, what are the best parameters to achieve the maximum performance for particular system size. We ran the production simulation for one and a second using two, uh, two um, um, uh, using a billion atom sample, and we are doing these uh, two million MD steps. Uh, and we want to do good science, because we want a lot of, not ours, on summit. We wanted to do good science, we want to observe some good science uh, 
uh, during these simulations. So performance metric is important. Uh, total number of flops, so this is something that computer scientists do, but we as practitioners, uh, practitioners of MD simulations, we are interested in uh, MD performance metric. And performance metric is determined to m item steps per node per second. This is important for the for the our community because sometimes you compare performance of different codes and different potentials, and people report different numbers. And these numbers are meaningless if you don't do this unified metric. So this is important. Um, so then, uh, these are the results. Uh, so this, these are the scaling results. Aiden briefly discussed. We had excellent performance for the billion atom and more. If you go down, we start seeing some degradation because the optimum number of uh, atoms on the uh, G, uh, on the uh, six GPU summit nodes is around uh, two hundred thousand atoms. When you start going lower, you start paying communication cost. Okay, and this is the uh, this is the synthesis. We we observe this BC8 phase in uh, starting from the amorphous liquid-like precursor. We we see the nucleation of the BC8 and eventually formation of the uh, uh, polycrystalline BC8 phase. And this is the performance versus simulated physical time. And these are the series of simulations. So once we observe this nucleation and full conversion of the sample into BC8, we stop simulation on, we are, we, we are, we are not exiting the, the, the production run, we just reset inside of lumps, we reset the initial conditions to different temperature and we continue simulations. And once, once we see the formation of the BC8, we, we again switch. So we, we did different sampling of the temperatures. I can tell you that although it's 24 hour simulations, you know, when you do a bookkeeping, but it turned out it took more than 24 hours. It took three or four days. The reason why? Because we broke sand. So we run simulations. We always uh, do the checkpointing things. We run simulations, then at some point, sand crashed. So then, you know, engineers go and check these. We start again. So actually, you know, uh, Stanmore is a very clever guy. So he had a special test to check every node before we start running simulations. Because we saw several tens of nodes just failing, just, just failing. We don't know the reason why. So this is an uh, important thing. OK, so now I'm talking about science. Probably I will do, so how many, how, how much time do I have? 20 minutes, OK, good. So 20 minutes focused science, or focus on science. So I showed you comparison with QMD, but what can, can, can it be done with QMD? Let's look at this. And this is the introductory slide. So we take the million atom polycrystal sample and want it to melt it. Okay, the reason? We want to sample this uh, melt, melt line of diamonds. Usually when you do melting calculations, you do this, if you want to, pre uh, to have precise melt melting curves, you have two-phase simulation. You put liquid solid in coexistence, vary the temperature, the given pressure, find, find the uh, stable interface when they, uh, the two phases coexist, okay? For the, uh, for the polycrystal sample, you don't need to. You just vary the temperatures, you have these uh, grain boundaries, they initiate formation of the liquid phase, and uh, this, this is the, uh, this is polycrystalline stars or polycrystalline uh, simulations. And you see it's very good agreements with our previous two phase, both QMD and SNAP. So now I want to go back to this business of, of BC8. I said that no signal of BC8 from diffraction, uh, large energy barrier. And this was very well known. This, as I said, is a fundamental problem in the high pressure science, several people uh, tried to solve this problem thinking about different transition pathways, how we can overcome this huge energy barrier, barrier uh, related to the uh, uh, conversion of the BC, uh, time, uh, diamond to BC8. So they proposed very complex path, and actually this was put, put forth in the proposal of the previous NIF experiment, so people tried to, so this, uh, these people tried to compress and then, you know, release and see whether uh, BC8 forms, it turned out it's not. Uh, problem with, this is metadynamics, it's not QMD. At that time, QMD was very expensive, but not only expensive, but also impossible because of this huge barrier if you start with the pure crystal one phase. So not, no real-time dynamics. We want to do better. So first, we want to understand why diamond is so metastable. And 
so we took the uh, polycrystal sample. So this is what, from thermodynamical point of view, should be diamond, BCA, simple cubic, and so on and so forth. And then we take this one million atom polycrystal simulation. We, ha we run hundreds of simulations up to one nanosecond. So you, you, you can understand the volume of these simulations. And we're sampling all these pressures and temperatures. And we want to see what happens here. Okay? And importantly, will we see the BCA? This is, this is the fundamental question. OK, so this is one of the simulations when you will start seeing formation of the B seed. And look at the, what happens. So you, you, you want to pay attention to these green boundaries. Then something happens, and material becomes homogeneous. And then you start seeing formation of B seed. So you see that it melts at the green boundaries. Completely melts, okay? And then you're starting forming the BC, so you start forming nucleus, and then this, this nucleus grows, and eventually you get, you know, almost single crystal. This is the effect of the periodic boundary conditions. We run bigger simulations, you see, we see different, different uh, morphologies of, this, uh, of the resultant sample. So, what we found, we found that diamond actually first melts, and then, it forms a nucleus of the BC8, and, and this nucleus grows, and eventually get the BC8 phase. So we looked at the diffusion. So initially, we start with the solid material, no diffusion. Diffusion, so we, as the liquid phase increases, fraction of liquid phase increases, we start seeing diffusion. Fraction of diamond drops, uh, liquid fr uh, fraction increases, and then at some point, we start nucleating BC8. Is BC8 single crystal? So, so this one, this, this this one single crystal. But I'm going to talk about the effect of the temperature mm -hmm. on the polycrystallinity of the sample. Um, just in a second. Uh, okay. Eva, Eva, yes. So it's a, it's a liquid. It is like a really liquid or just a more fast. Liquid, because we look at the diffusion. Yeah. We look at the diffusion. There is a diffusion coefficient. What do you mean small distance? This is the diffusion coefficient, so this is liquid. Definitely not the liquid, because, because we, uh, I'm going to show you later, we examined all these temperatures and pressure ranges, and we do see the transi transition from the liquid to amorphous state, because diffusion drops. Okay, so we monitor, it's important, diffusion is important to understand whether it's liquid or amorphous. Okay, uh, so then, uh, this is the final thing. I don't want to go into this, but this is the BC8 region. So the most important thing that uh, narrow region of the pressures and temperature when we see the BC8. That's why people don't see when they do this uh, compression. By the way, they don't do uh, shock compression because when you do shock compression, you immediately go into liquid. So you don't go into, into this. Uh, so this should be the um, phase boundary between BC8 and simple cubic around 1,000 GP. But uh, the experiments were done with the RAM compression. It's not shock, you're just compressing, but at low temperature. That's why you're not sampling this region. That's why we understand what we need to do to observe this BC8, okay? Now we look at the problem of the time and length scales with our big MD simulations. We did billion atom simulations for one nanosecond. And the question is whether this boundary where we see the BC8 is something that is a uh, we can believe uh, direct MD simulation turned out it is not because, again, of the time and length scale of MD simulations. Because we are nucleating, nucleating uh, BC8 from liquid. Okay, it's important. So you first melt diamond and then nucleate from liquid. And nucleation of a solid phase through liquid, uh, from liquid is uh, activated process. So that's why you have this problem with the time scale. Uh, so, and, and also practically important, when we uh, show these results to our experimental people, as I said, no way. Okay? We cannot do diffraction of these high pressures because if you compress these high pressures, you have a very, very strong background because they, they generate the X-rays by shining this, you know, this ultraviolet light, you know, very intense ultraviolet light to the target and then generate x-rays. And then under such high, high compression, the compression of the sample, this, this, this thing creates a lot of background when you, you don't see the diffraction. No way. So, uh, so that now we started thinking practically whether, we, whether what we predicted is the true thing. And it turned out that 
uh, the time scale is, is uh, and less scale are important. So going back to Vasily's question, uh, Vasily's question uh, concerning the uh, microstructure. So this is the fixed pressure, okay? So it's around uh, 18, uh, so it's 1800 uh, GP. And uh, we did simulations at different temperatures. So if we are a, a little bit here, so this is uh, five, 550, we don't see any nucleation. We wait for several nanoseconds, we see no BC. Then if you lower temperature, you start seeing almost single crystal. When you start lowering, you start seeing more grains, more grains, more grains. And then we go into this area, we are in amorphous state. Okay, so we don't see anything here. So the question is how we can, so we know that it's activated process, how we can get, uh, get the solution for this. In order to do this, we start doing something more sophisticated. We start applying the classical nucleation theory. So as I said, this, this is the nucleation process. It's a typical classical problem for classical nucleation theory. You have the two terms, you have the surface term, and you have the bulk term. So the, when the class is small, the surface term is dominated. So this is the uh, uh, surface free energy, and this is the difference between the uh, bulk and, and surface free energies. And so when you add these two components, you have the barrier. So in order to start nucleating, you have to overcome this barrier. We want to calculate this. And based on this barrier, we want to predict what would be the temperature, the highest temperature, for a given size of the experimental sample when we can observe these within one nanosecond. This is our goal. Because they, they do compression within several nanoseconds at NIF. Okay? So how we do this? The critical thing is to calculate the critical nucleus. So we put this nucleus inside of the liquid and we write, run NPH. So uh, at a given, uh, so we don't control the temperature, we control the enthalpy and temperature changes until it stabilizes the thing. So if, if, if temperature, initial temperature was high, a little bit high, the cluster starts uh, melting and then it shrinks to the critical nucleus size. So we plot this critical size as a function of this, um, Overheating, so this is the melting temperature minus a given temperature. So this is the driving force for the nucleation. So this is the critical nuclear size from the classical nucleation theory. This is point, by the way, from MD. That's why we cannot do MD to get to, to get to get to the uh, to, to the smaller driving force. Okay, so that's why you know we need this. Uh, uh, classical nucleation theory. So then, as I said, that uh, all the quantities for classical nucleation theory were cal calculated with SNAP. So we do the thermodynamic integration to get all these free energies. We get the free, uh, energy barrier, this, um, this, this barrier that I was talking about. And uh, uh, we have this um, um, initial number of uh, atoms in the sample. We know the sample uh, real experimental size that we, we plan to do the experiments and we determine what is the maximum temperature. And you can clearly see that this temperature, I remember that I was talking about 5,500, we pushed it to 6,000. So this is the, and by the way, this is another interesting thing. We wanted, we validated the classical nucleation theory and I think that this is the first MD simulation that directly maps classical nucleation theory to, uh, to direct MD simulation. So we see this initial stage of the incubation where we so form several nuclei and then once they reach the critical size, they start drawing, static growth, and then they start you know, merging together, um, uh, coarsening and so on and so forth. So this is, this is the validation these are the MD points and this is the classical nucleation theory. So based on these simulations, we designed the experimental pathway. So what do experiments need, experimentalists need to do in order to observe BC? So this is the, the boundary. I, I mentioned that you know, if you do direct MD simulations, you, you predict that uh, this is the boundary where you see the BCH. In turn that we push to 12 megabars, it's acceptable for them. They can do diffraction 12 megabars, okay? And we predicted in order to get there, you need to do double shock. So shock once to three megabars and then to 12 megabars. And uh, so we actually tried three years to get the time. So we submitted proposals, we were criticized, we, we, we improved our proposal, we, we did some simulations, we did some preliminary experiments, but eventually we got time. So time on NIF, the most powerful laser system in the world. So they uh, use this piece of diamond, the key is to have thick diamond to increase the nucleation time. 
uh, and you do you you drive the you you, sh you shine the light to drive the compression through the ablation, and you have the X-ray, and you measure diffraction, and this is prediction of our diffractions from our MD simulations. What we want to do, we want to drive the shock, shine 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 the X-ray, uh, get the spectrum, compare with with our simulations, and determine how much we have BC8 and where do we see the BC8. So this is our team. And we actually did the first experiment a month ago. So this is, uh, this is our team. Uh, we went to Neve, and this is the photo after, after the shot. So we actually shot was at 3 a.m. This is 12 p.m. So we, we went for a couple of hours of sleep and then came back just to celebrate. OK, so how much time? Five minutes, right? Yeah. Three, three minutes. OK, all right. So quickly, shock simulations, how we do the shock simulations. As I said, that is important. If you looked at my previous results, there is a, at small intensities, crystal anisotropy, anisotropy plays a bigger role. Uh, so how we do the simulations, we use snap. We, we drive the, uh, the, uh, the compression by piston. We see the split shock wave, elastic and elastic. The most fundamental problem in shock compression of diamond. And when you remember, when I saw the, actually I can show you here, okay, a lot of interest in uh, shock compression of diamond because diamond is unique material. Nobody understands how does diamond crash. People are talking about dislocations. Not sure because it's not metal. It's cracks. A lot of uncertainty. We want to see some atomic scale insight. So. Um, we run uh, shock simulations at three. So this is very thorough. We, we spent a lot of node hours on summit to simulate shock compression. Our samples are pretty big. Uh, so from 30 million to 2 billion atoms. So we run different combinations. And to sample this, you cannot run all these points with two, two billion, sim, uh, billion atom simulation because it's six, six, uh, six hours on the full summit machine. So we can run hundreds of these simulations because it's expensive, so we do small scale. But uh, this, these are the results. So the, concerning, the, concerning the agreement with the experiment, at high compression, as I said, it's almost hydrostatic compression. No problem. We see the melting going into liquid. Uh, then we look at this uh, crystal anisotropy. Also good agreement. Some, there are some scattering between the experiments as well. But what, what we found that this crystal anisotropy, how you can press the crystal along different crystallographic directions, does matter. And you think that at some point it doesn't because everything is converted into defective sample. And when defective amorphous-like type of thing, you think that it becomes hydrostatically compressed or some, some crystal anisotropy is gone. What we found, we made a major discovery that this crystal anisotropy propagates even in the liquid solid coexistence when you, you see this crystalline pieces inside of the liquid. I want to show you, so this is something that Aiden showed. Probably I want to skip this. Uh, but I'll, OK, maybe, maybe I should play just quickly because it's uh, only 30 seconds. Sorry. No, it doesn't want to play. OK, so the same simulation. But what I do here, I move together with the piston. So, so it's a moving window kind of thing. So, uh, so material is pushed, so then the, the fast wave propagates the elastic wave, and then you see these defects, these, these things, cracks crack, crack like of uh, defects are forming. So actually you're forming, you are, you are not cracking, you're not doing some just regular cracking, you are melting, it's like a local melting along these one-on-one -on -one slip directions. And then these amorphous-like regions resolidify back to diamond. And you clearly see that there is a crystal rotation, what Vasily was talking about. Clearly, you see that here. OK, so it's crystal rotation. So, and uh, we found the, uh, you know, depending on the crystallographic direction, you have different mechanisms. So for the 110 rotation, and eventually forming this polycrystalline sample, going from single crystal to polycrystalline. So, it kind of melts, partially melts, and then it facilitates rotation. And then you have the polycrystalline uh, structure. As I, as I mentioned, that we see this, you know, this mixed phase region, okay, and you see this crystalline anisotropy. So we're almost 
at the exit into the liquid part. And you see this 100111 here, almost at the extension of the liquid Hugonian. So this is going along the liquid Hugonian. And one point is 111. Okay, so what happens with 111? Let's, let's play another movie. Okay, you see that we completely melted diamond. And then it starts with solidifying. You see, it's forming, forming diamond nuclear inside of the liquid. So, and by the way, we show this result to experimental people. And they observe this overshooting. They see the, they see the crystalline diffraction peaks in the liquid part because of this. So you're going into metal stable states, the crystal stays metal stable, and then it, it collapses into liquid at some point. Okay, so I don't have time to talk about this. So we, we struggled with, the, uh, with this uh, new discovery science experiment because as I said, that we said that we need to compress to 16 megabars. They say, no way. Then we told them, okay, let's do Liquid-like state. What is liquid-like state? Amorphous. So we said, them, okay, let's, let's do amorphous. And they start crying, okay, what are you talking about? There are no amorphous carbons. If there, if there is amorphous carbon, it's thickness of the, uh, you know, uh, nanometers, tens of nanometers, you know, these thin films that, you know, hard drives are covered by the uh, diamond-like carbon. We need 50 micron. Then one guy who was part of the, uh, ICF program, he said, okay, we have this LDRD program to devise these uh, alternative ablative materials. They try to deposit amorphous carbon. And that's why we, we, we accidentally came to this ICF and we got funding from the um, Fusion Energy Science to develop the uh, new ablative materials. I mentioned about this problem with diamonds. You have to go up to here to melt it completely because you don't want these to have, during this, amorphous carbon is good because it's liquid-like but you don't know what is the property. So our prediction that we can lower so-called these uh, uh, fuel idea bars. So it means that it's, it's a tendency to heat the fuel that is bad for the ignition. We can lower because we can go into liquid part faster, okay? Because amorphous carbon is more compressible and you go into liquid part faster. So we predicted factor of four. We, we actually, uh, also submitted proposals and got time at Omega and European x to look at the properties of the amorphous carbon and its transformations. So, main message. So we are at excited time, excited time because of these new facilities coming in online, European x LCLS at Stanford, NIF. We have good experiments, powerful experiments, People start doing movies with the X-ray diffraction on European X-Files with, with the time resolution of several tenths of femtoseconds. They can do these movies, but they do diffraction. They do diffraction, they don't see the atomic structure. They need us, simulators, because what we can, we can simulate these at the time scale approaching their time and length scales using these big computers, but this is the critical piece. This is why Aaron is a very important person in the field because he pushed this to run this, to get this very efficient, very accurate snap potential that can be run on the big machines very efficiently, he and his team. And uh, so I think that uh, it's important also to emphasize that we work with the experimentalists. They didn't listen to us for the first time. So they always say, okay, this prediction, okay, we don't trust you. Then eventually we persuaded this is what we need to do. And I think that this is where, uh, the way to work together with people. So try to show them what they cannot do. And critical piece is the uh, potentials and big computers. Thank you. <laughs>